Did you know that DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid in all human beings is 99.9% .9 identical? It is that one-tenth of one percent difference that makes us all unique. DNA derives its name from deoxyribonucleic acid, a type of nucleic acid. Nucleic acids are made up of polynucleotide chains, which are formed by several nucleotides or molecules that make up the structure of the DNA when bonded together. In fact, the length of a DNA is defined by the number of nucleotides or pairs of nucleotides present in the DNA. A pair of nucleotides is also known as a base pair. For example, E. coli has 4.6 multiplied by 10 raised to the power 6 base pairs. And bacteriophage lambda has 48,502 base pairs. While the haploid content of human DNA has 3.3 multiplied by 10 raised to the power 9 base pairs. It was in the year 1869 that Friedrich Miescher first identified DNA as an acidic material present in the nucleus and called it the nuclein. However, technical limitations made it very difficult to isolate such a long polymer intact and therefore no further interpretations regarding the structure of DNA were made for several years. Finally, in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick proposed a simple double helix model for the structure of DNA. They did this with the help from the X-ray diffraction data that was created by Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin. Further, James Watson and Francis Crick proposed that base pairing existed between two strands of polynucleotide chains which was a distinctive attribute of their proposition. This proposition was based on the observations made by Erwin Chagaff, who found that the ratios between adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosin are constant and equal to 1 for a double-stranded DNA. In fact, due to base pairing, the polynucleotide chains possess a very unique property that is, the strands of the base pairs are complementary to each other. Therefore, if we know the sequence of bases on one strand, it is possible to predict the sequence in the other. Moreover, when two strands of a parental DNA separate, each serves as a template for synthesis of a new daughter strand because of complementary base pairing, and the two double-stranded daughter DNA generated are identical to the parent DNA molecule. Thus, these discoveries provided a clearer picture to the genetic implications of the DNA structure, and soon the DNA double helix structure and its simplicity in explaining genetic implications became revolutionary. Let us now learn about the chemical structure of a polynucleotide chain present in the DNA double helix structure. The polynucleotide chain is made up of three components, a nitrogenous base, a phosphate group, and a pentose sugar, which is deoxyribose. Further, the nitrogenous base is of two types, purines and pyrimidines. The purines comprise adenine and guanine while the pyrimidines comprise cytosin and thymine. Now, through an N-glycosidic linkage, a nitrogenous base is linked to the pentose sugar, forming a nucleoside, which can be guanosin or deoxyguanosin, adenosin or deoxyadenosin, uridin or deoxythymidin, and citidin, or deoxycytidin. Conversely, depending on the sugar present, a nucleotide or a deoxynucleotide is formed when a phosphate group is linked to 5 prime OH of a nucleoside through the phosphoester linkage. 
Also, a dinucleotide is formed when two nucleotides are linked through a 3 prime 5 prime phosphodiester linkage and several such nucleotides can join similarly to form a polynucleotide chain. At one end of this chain is a free phosphate moiety at the 5 prime end of ribose sugar, which is called the 5 prime end of the polynucleotide chain. Similarly, at the other end of the chain is present a ribose with a free 3 prime OH group, which is called the 3 prime end of the polynucleotide chain. A salient feature of the double helix DNA structure is that it comprises two polynucleotide chains, the backbone of which is constituted by sugar phosphate with bases projecting inside. The double helix structure has several other salient features too. Its two polynucleotide chains have anti-parallel polarity. That is, if one chain has a polarity 5-3- the other has 3-5-. Moreover, the bases of the two DNA strands are paired with the help of hydrogen bonds forming base pairs. Adenine is bonded with thymine from the opposite strand with two hydrogen bonds and vice versa. Similarly, guanine is bonded with cytosine with three hydrogen bonds. Because of this structure, a purine always comes opposite to a pyrimidine, which results in a uniform distance being maintained between the two helix strands. Another salient feature of the helix structure is that the two chains are coiled in a right-handed fashion. Therefore, the pitch of the helix is 3.4 nanometers and each turn consists of about 10 base pairs. As a result, the distance between a base pair and a helix is around 0.34 nanometers. Additionally, in a DNA double helix, the plane of one base pair stacks over the other, which along with the hydrogen bonds, makes the helical structure very stable. The stable DNA helix structure allows it to be the genetic material that has instructions for the development and functioning of all known living organisms. Did you know that the length of a DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid double helix in a typical mammalian cell is about 2.2 meters? This length is obtained by multiplying the total number of base pairs present in the DNA double helix with the distance between two consecutive base pairs. Now the total number of base pairs present in a DNA double helix in a typical mammalian cell is 6.6 .6 multiplied by 10 raised to the power 9 and the distance between two consecutive base pairs is 0.34 nanometers or 0.34 multiplied by 10 raised to the power minus 9 meters. By multiplying these two factors, we get the length of the DNA double helix as 2.2 meters. Have you wondered how such a long polymer is packaged within a typical nucleus with a dimension of about 10 raised to the power minus 6 meters? To understand this, let us learn about the packaging of a DNA double helix, which is different for both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. In prokaryotes such as E. coli, the nucleus is not very well defined. However, the negatively charged DNA is not scattered throughout the cell, but is arranged in large loops is held together by a few positively charged proteins in a region known as the nucleoid. On the other hand, in eukaryotes, the manner in which a DNA double helix is packaged within the cell is more complex. Eukaryotes contain a single molecule of negatively charged DNA packaged around a spool of positively charged basic proteins known as histones. 
The charge in a protein is decided by the abundance of amino acid residues with charged side chains. Now in this case, the proteins are positively charged as the histones are rich in basic amino acid residues like lysins and arginines, which carry positive charges in their side chains. Furthermore, the histones are arranged to form a unit of eight molecules known as the histone octama. Now around the positively charged octama, a negatively charged DNA molecule is wrapped to form a structure known as the nucleosome, which is held in place by the H1 histone. A typical nucleosome has around 200 base pairs of DNA helix and the nucleosomes present in chromatin can be seen as a beads on string structure when observed under an electron microscope. It is the nucleosomes that make up the repeating unit in chromatin, the thread-like bodies present in nucleus. Now the chromatin fibers are of two types, euchromatin and heterochromatin. In a typical nucleus, euchromatin fibers of 30 to 80 nanometers in diameter are loosely packed and stain light. On the other hand, heterochromatin fibers of about 300 nanometers in diameter are more densely packed and stain dark. Moreover, of the two types of chromatin fibers, euchromatin is transcriptionally active, while heterochromatin is inactive. These chromatin fibers coil further and condense to form short and thick bodies called chromosomes during the metaphase stage of cell division. In this way, a DNA double helix is packaged into a chromosome which is further packaged within the nucleus. If we stored the entire DNA sequence of a single human cell in books, we would have 3,300 books, each with 1,000 pages, where every page contains 1,000 letters. Yes, a human genome which has about 3 multiplied by 10 to the power of 9 base pairs, can produce such an enormous amount of data. In fact, an ambitious international scientific research project called the Human Genome Project or HGP set out to do just that, to determine the complete sequence of base pairs of DNA inside the human genome. More precisely, the HGP aimed to identify approximately 20,000 to 25,000 genes in human DNA. The average gene consists of 3,000 bases. However, gene sizes vary greatly. Did you know that dystrophin is the largest known human gene? which has 2.4 million bases? Now, if you add the number of base pairs in the human genome, the sequences of more than 3 billion chemical base pairs would have to be determined under the HGP. Therefore, by aiming to understand the genetic makeup of the human species, the HGP served an important purpose. It was important because it is a sequence of bases in our DNA that determine our genetic information. 99.9% .9 of all nucleotide bases are exactly the same in people. Yet we differ from each other and that is because our DNA sequences differ in certain places. Scientists have identified about 1.4 million locations with single base DNA differences also known as SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphism. Knowledge about variations in the human genome 
can equip us with more ways to diagnose, treat or even prevent disorders and ailments that affect human beings. Similarly, knowledge of the repetitive sequences in DNA shed a lot of light on chromosome structure and evolution. Repetitive sequences, also known as microsatellites, are those stretches of DNA sequences that are repeated many times, sometimes a hundred to a thousand times, in the human genome. Also, they have no direct coding functions. In fact, less than 2% of genome codes for proteins and for more than half the discovered genes are still unknown. With the advent of advanced genetic engineering methods, it was now possible to isolate and clone a piece of DNA to determine its sequence. So even though the HGP was a mammoth project, it was a viable one. Since the HGP aimed to store the entire genome information in databases, it required high-speed computational devices for data storage and retrieval. In addition, the HGP required improved tools for data analysis. Thus, the HGP is also credited with contributing to the rapid development of a new branch of biology called bioinformatics which involves the application of statistics and computer sciences to the field of molecular biology. The HGP was a 13-year project that began in 1990 and was completed in 2003. It was coordinated by the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. National Institute of Health. Did you know that initially it was James D. Watson one of the co-discoverers of the double helix structure of DNA, who headed the project. However, in the initial years of the HGP, Wellcome Trust of the UK became a major partner, though more contributions arrived from countries such as Japan, France, Germany and China, to name a few. Although the HGP had aimed to understand the genetic makeup of the human species, it also focused on several other non-human species such as the bacterium E. coli, yeast, a free-living non-pathogenic nematode called Cenorhabditis elegans, a fruit fly called Drosophila, and the laboratory mouse. Learning about non-human DNA sequences can lead to a further understanding of their natural capacities and traits, which may offer solutions in various sectors such as health, agriculture and energy production. Apart from transferring information and technologies to other sectors, the HGP also intended to address ethical, legal and social issues, or ELSI, that may have developed while working on the project. Therefore, though the HGP was a mammoth and hugely beneficial project, it required enormous effort, cost and innovation as well as caution to accomplish it successfully. In 1869, Friedrich Miescher isolated an acidic material from the nucleus of a cell and called it nuclein now known as nucleic acids. Also around the same time, Gregor Mendel proposed the principles of inheritance. In fact, Gregor Mendel, Thomas Hunt Morgan, Walter Sutton and numerous other scientists had narrowed their search for genetic material to chromosomes. However, as chromosomes of eukaryotes contain several proteins along with DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, scientists couldn't exactly confirm 
whether the genetic material was DNA or proteins or both. By around 1926, the search for the mechanism of inheritance of genetic material had reached the molecular level, yet the genetic material had still not been discovered. However, in 1928, Frederick Griffith, a British scientist, conducted an experiment that accidentally demonstrated the transformation of genetic material in bacteria. In fact, Frederick Griffith was in the process of developing a vaccine against the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae that caused pneumonia by inoculating the dead microbes along similar lines of Louis Pasteur's experiments on vaccination. Frederick grew the bacteria in a culture plate and found that they were of two forms, the smooth and the rough. This was because the smooth shiny colonies or the S strain of the bacteria possessed a mucus or a polysaccharide coat, while the rough colonies or the R strain had no such coat. Further, when the mice were injected with the S strain, they died of pneumonia infection, while those injected with the R strain did not develop pneumonia. This proved that the S strain of bacteria was virulent or lethal, while the R strain was harmless. Moreover, Frederick also found that heating killed the bacteria. So when he injected heat-killed S strain bacteria into the mice, they did not die. On the other hand, when he injected a mixture of R strain bacteria and heat-killed S strain bacteria, the mice died. Surprisingly, he even recovered the living S strain of bacteria from the dead mice. So on the basis of this experiment, Frederick concluded that the heat-killed S strain bacteria had somehow transformed the R strain bacteria. He also concluded that the reason why the R strain bacteria produced a smooth polysaccharide coat and became lethal or virulent was because of the transfer of some genetic material from the heat-killed S-strain bacteria. However, there was still no means to ascertain or identify the genetic material that was transferred and responsible for the transformation process. Later, after 16 years, in 1944, a team of three scientists, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty once again began research on the experiment that was once conducted by Frederick. At that time, they tried to identify the biochemical nature of the transforming principle in Frederick's experiment. For this, the scientists first purified biochemicals such as proteins, DNA, and RNA or ribonucleic acid from the heat-killed S-strain bacteria. They did so to identify the biochemical responsible for transforming the live R-strain into S-strain bacterial cells. Through their experiments, they discovered that it was the DNA from the S-strain bacteria that had transformed the R-strain bacteria. They also found that digestion of the DNA of heat-killed S-strain with DNAs inhibited transformation. Further, the scientists also discovered that addition of proteases or protein digesting enzymes and RNases or RNA digesting enzymes did not affect the transformation. This led to the conclusion that proteins or RNA were not transforming substances and implied that DNA was the cause for the transformation. Thus, through their experiments, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Macklin McCarty concluded that DNA is the hereditary material in most living organisms. Nevertheless, many biologists were still unconvinced that DNA is the hereditary material. 
and so the search for genetic material continued for several years and was concluded with the discovery of DNA. Once it was proved that DNA was the primary genetic material in the living system, it was natural to conclude that DNA replicates as a molecule qualifies as genetic material only if it replicates. Scientists Watson and Crick, who in 1953 had proved that DNA had a double helical structure, had also suggested a probable scheme for the replication of DNA. According to their proposed scheme, the two strands separated and acted as a template for the synthesis of two new complementary strands. After the replication process was completed, each DNA molecule would end up with one parental strand and one newly synthesized strand. That is why this DNA replication scheme was referred to as semi-conservative. In 1958, to find conclusive evidence for this scheme of semi-conservative DNA replication, experiments were conducted by scientists Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl on bacteria Escherichia coli or E. coli, a bacteria that divides every 20 minutes. Messelson and Stahl grew E. coli in a medium that had NH4Cl15 isotope as the only nitrogen source. N15 isotope is a heavy isotope of nitrogen, but it is not radioactive. Many generations of E. coli were bred in the same medium, which was not too hard to achieve since a new E. coli generation arrived every 20 minutes. As a result, newly synthesized DNA2 had the N15 isotope as a constituent of purines and pyrimidines. This new heavy DNA molecule was distinguished from normal DNA by virtue of its high density while being extracted by a centrifugation in a cesium chloride or CSCL density gradient. Later, E. coli cells were transferred into a medium with normal NH4Cl14 isotope. After the cells multiplied, their DNA was extracted and separated independently in CSCL gradients to record the density of DNA. It turned out that DNA extracted from the first progeny of E. coli after the transfer from the N15 isotope to the N14 isotope medium had an intermediate density. It was referred to as hybrid DNA. The next generation of E. coli, which was born after 40 minutes, had equal amounts of hybrid DNA and light DNA. Thus, the findings of the Messelson and Stahl experiment established the validity of Watson and Crick's theory of the semi-conservative DNA replication scheme. Similar experiments were further conducted in higher organisms such as plants and human cells to prove the same. One such experiment was conducted by Dr. J. Herbert Taylor and his colleagues in 1958. In root tip cells of Vicia faba or faba beans, using radioactive thymidine to determine the distribution of newly synthesized DNA in chromosomes. Here again, the experiment proved that DNA replication even in chromosomes was semi conservative. Therefore, with multiple experiments conducted by different scientists, it was concluded that DNA replicates semi-conservatively. DNA replication is a fundamental process that all living organisms undergo to copy their DNA.
It is an elaborate process that requires several enzymes such as helicases, depoisomerases, DNA polymerase, and DNA ligase to catalyze the replication reaction. In a cell, DNA replication begins at a specific point. For example, bacteria E. coli has a definite region where the DNA replication originates. Such a region is known as the origin of replication. This is also the reason why a vector is required when a piece of DNA needs to be replicated during recombinant DNA procedures, as it is the vector that provides the origin of replication. In some cases like eukaryotes with large DNA molecules, there may be many origins of replication that finally merge with one another. During replication, first the enzyme helicases unwind and uncoil the DNA double helix into single strands of DNA by the breakdown of hydrogen bonds. However, the main enzyme that catalyzes the replication process after it begins at the origin of replication is DNA polymerase, which is said to be DNA dependent as it uses the DNA template to catalyze the polymerization of deoxyribonucleotides. The DNA replication process requires a high degree of accuracy because any error during replication will result in mutations. Thankfully, DNA polymerase is a highly efficient enzyme that catalyzes the reaction not only with accuracy but also does it very swiftly. It catalyzes the polymerization of a large number of nucleotides in a very short span. For instance, E. coli can replicate 4.6 into 10 to the power 6 base pairs of diploid content in 38 minutes. That is, the average rate of polymerization is 2000 base pairs per second. The replication process is also an expensive process in the sense that it requires expenditure of energy. The deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates that act as substrates also serve as the energy source for the reaction. The terminal phosphates in the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates break down to provide energy as ATP. Due to the high energy requirement, two DNA strands do not always separate completely, especially in the case of long DNA molecules. However, to facilitate the separation of a DNA helix, the enzyme topoisomerase cuts and rejoins one strand of DNA. This then unzips the double-stranded DNA. As a result, replication bubbles are formed that extend as a Y-shaped replication fork. This replication fork is actually a small opening in the DNA helix where replication occurs. However, there is a small catch. The DNA-dependent DNA polymerase enzyme can catalyze the replication reaction in only one direction, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This causes additional complications. Replication on one template strand that has 3' prime to 5' prime polarity, also known as the leading strand, is continuous. Whereas replication on the other template strand with 5' prime to 3', prime, also referred to as the lagging strand, is discontinuous. These discontinuously replicated fragments, also known as Okazaki fragments, are then joined by the enzyme DNA ligase. Further, cellular proofreading mechanisms ensure the fidelity of DNA replication. 
In case wrong bases are entered into the helix of DNA by mutation, the enzyme nuclease can identify and correct them. They cut off the defective segment of DNA and introduce the correct segment, which is then joined by the enzyme DNA ligase. However, scientists are still to understand all the aspects of DNA replication. Although it is a known fact that replication of DNA in eukaryotes takes place in the synthesis phase of the cell cycle. The cell cycle too needs to be coordinated with the replication process or a chromosome anomaly may occur. For example, a failure in cell division after DNA replication results in an inheritance disorder as polyploidy. Therefore, the process of DNA replication, which is the basis of biological inheritance, is conducted with accuracy with the help of various enzymes in a determined manner. Proteins play a pivotal role in the proper functioning of any organism. The synthesis of proteins occurs in the cell in two phases, namely transcription and translation. Transcription takes place in the nucleus where the DNA acts as a template for the synthesis of messenger RNA. It is a process by which genetic information in DNA is transferred to a molecule of messenger RNA. It is governed by the principle of complementarity with one exception that adenine now forms base pair with uracil instead of thymine. Messenger RNA carries the genetic information to the cytoplasm for protein synthesis and hence it gets the name messenger. The transcription process is different from DNA replication. In replication, the total DNA of an organism gets duplicated while in transcription only one DNA strand gets copied into RNA. In case both DNA strands act as templates in transcription, two types of proteins will be produced. One with the correct sequence and the other with the reverse sequence of amino acids. Moreover, the simultaneously produced RNA molecules would become complementary to each other and would form double-stranded RNA. As a result, RNA will not get translated into protein and the process of transcription will get nullified. However, such an occurrence is quite rare. The segment of DNA which takes part in the transcription process is called the transcription unit and it encodes for at least one gene. Let's understand the transcription unit in detail. It consists of three main regions, namely the promoter, the structural gene and the terminator. The promoter is the starting point of the transcription process and is present upstream at the 5' prime end of the structural gene. In the promoter, there is a binding site for RNA polymerase which moves along the DNA strand from 3' prime to 5' prime direction. With the help of RNA polymerase, the promoter can code for the two strands of the DNA helix. However, these two DNA strands will get reversed if the promoter switches its position with the terminator. The next part of the transcription unit is the structural gene, which consists of two DNA strands having opposite polarity. The strand with the 3' prime to 5' prime polarity acts as a template and is called the template strand. While the DNA strand, which has 5' prime to 3' prime polarity, is known as the coding strand and is displaced during transcription.
The sequence of this strand is the same as that of RNA, except that thymine exists in place of uracil. The structural gene can be defined in terms of a cistron or segment of DNA that codes for a polypeptide. The structural gene in a transcription unit can be either monocystronic or polycystronic. A monocystronic structural gene contains the genetic information to translate only a single protein and is found in eukaryotes. On the other hand, a polycystronic structural gene carries the information of several genes which can be translated into several proteins. It is found in prokaryotes. The monocystronic structural gene has a split gene arrangement where sequences called introns and exons are present. However, in this gene arrangement only the exons act as coding sequences. The process of transcription helps remove introns and joins exons as functional messenger RNA. It is the exons in the structural gene along with the promoter which determine the inheritance of a character. The structural gene also consists of regulatory sequences which regulate the functions of other genes but do not code for any RNA or protein. They are also known as regulatory genes. At the three prime end of the structural gene is the terminator, which is another important part of the transcription unit. The terminator defines the end of the process of transcription. Transcription also happens to be the first stage in the process of gene expression. As it helps in the transcription of a gene into messenger RNA and encodes for a protein. The building of protein is very essential to the functioning of an organism. In this protein building task, DNA acts as a master blueprint containing all genetic information about the protein to be created. The genetic information from DNA is transferred to messenger RNA or mRNA through a process known as transcription. Now let's learn how transcription takes place in prokaryotes such as bacteria. The prokaryotic cell does not have separations in terms of cytoplasm and nucleus. Therefore, both transcription and translation processes involved in protein synthesis can take place inside the prokaryotic cell at the same time. In prokaryotes such as bacteria, only one DNA-dependent RNA polymerase enzyme catalyzes the transcription of all types of RNA. There are three types of RNAs involved in the process of protein synthesis. Messenger RNA or mRNA, transfer RNA or tRNA, and ribosomal RNA or rRNA. The mRNA carries the coding information to the sites of protein synthesis. It helps to put together amino acids to make protein. The tRNA carries each amino acid to the ribosome according to the coded message in the mRNA. While the rRNA provides a mechanism to decode mRNA into amino acids. Transcription, the first process in protein synthesis, occurs in three stages. Initiation, 
chain elongation and termination. In the first stage, RNA polymerase along with the initiation factor denoted as sigma binds to the promoter sequence in DNA and initiates transcription. This helps in the opening of the DNA helix and separates the two DNA strands. Now the second stage of transcription called elongation begins. In this stage, the RNA polymerase builds a strand of RNA using one of the DNA strands as a template. RNA polymerase uses nucleoside triphosphates as substrates and polymerizes using the law of complementarity. This RNA chain growth takes place in 5' prime to 3' prime direction. After chain elongation commences, the sigma factor dissociates from the RNA polymerase and can be reused. The final stage of transcription is termination in which the polymerase along with termination factor represented by rho reaches the terminator region and newly created mRNA fall off along with the enzyme. This marks the end of prokaryotic transcription. The stages of transcription in eukaryotes are similar to that of prokaryotic transcription. However, there are some differences as well. Let's understand them in detail. Unlike prokaryotic transcription, which occurs in cytoplasm transcription, in eukaryotes, transcription occurs in the nucleus. There is only one RNA polymerase in prokaryotic transcription. However, eukaryotic transcription involves at least three RNA polymerases. The RNA polymerase 1 transcribes various rRNAs. On the other hand, RNA polymerase 2 transcribes the precursor of mRNA known as heterogeneous nuclear RNA or HNRNA. RNA polymerase 3 is responsible for the transcription of tRNA, 5 subunit ribosomal RNA or 5SR RNA and small nuclear RNA or SNRNA. The processing of HNRNA marks another major difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription. The mRNA in prokaryotes does not require any processing. However, in eukaryotes, the hnRNA is inactive. Since it has a split gene arrangement with exons and introns, and hence it has to undergo processes such as capping, splicing, and tailing. The first process is capping, which involves an unusual nucleotide called methylguanosine triphosphate being added to the 5' end of the hnRNA. Capping helps mRNA to bind with small ribosomal subunits during protein synthesis. The next process is splicing, in which the introns are eliminated and exons are joined in a specific order. Finally, in the tailing process, about two to three hundred adenylate residues are added to the three prime end of the hnRNA in a template independent manner, giving rise to a poly A tail. This process is also known as polyadenylation. After these processes, the hnRNA becomes mRNA and the transcription process ends. 
the mRNA can now be transported out of the nucleus and further used for the process of protein synthesis during translation. In 1962, James Watson and Francis Crick won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for deciphering the structure of DNA, the molecule that contains an organism's genetic blueprint. Through experiments, Watson and Crick had revealed that DNA was a double helix polynucleotide molecule with each nucleotide consisting of the deoxyribose sugar, phosphoric acid and nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine that are commonly called nucleotides. After the DNA structure was revealed, these scientists got busy finding an answer to the next question. How the nucleotides get converted into amino acids that synthesized proteins, the building blocks of life. These scientists already knew that DNA directs RNA synthesis, which in turn acts as a template in the synthesis of protein. therefore suspected the presence of a genetic code, a set of rules in a gene that instructs a cell on how to synthesize a particular amino acid from the nucleotides of an RNA strand. The scientists now had only one aim, to decipher this genetic code. George Gamow, a Russian physicist, was the first to achieve some success in deciphering the code. He initially suggested that since the mRNA strand consists of only four types of nucleotides that code for the 20 amino acids in the human body, they need to combine to form a particular code. Through mathematical formulae, Gamow then proved that a permutation and combination of three nucleotides would be sufficient to make up a specific code for each of the 20 amino acids. The logic behind Gamow's postulation was easy to see. A single nucleotide, for instance, would code only four amino acids. Likewise, the combination and permutation of two nucleotides would result in codes for only 16 amino acids. However, the combination and permutation between three nucleotides would code for 64 amino acids, a little more than required. But nonetheless, Gamow stuck to his postulation. Those scientists were now aware that a combination of three nucleotides was all that was required to make a particular code. They had another question which combination of nucleotides coded which amino acid? The answer to these questions came from research scientists Marshall Nirenberg and Heinrich Mattei. They created a free cell system by grinding E. coli bacteria using a mortar and pestle to obtain E. coli extracts. The E. coli was then added to a test tube containing everything needed for protein synthesis including ribosomes and amino acids to name a few. However, the test tube lacked an mRNA without which protein synthesis was not possible. The scientists then added artificially synthesized mRNA consisting of only one base, uracil, in the free cell system. The E. coli extract in the free cell system was now able to produce a protein chain made of one repeating amino acid, phenylalanine, with the help of the Severo Ochoa enzyme called polynucleotide phosphorylase that was present in the extract. This suggested triplet UUU codes for the amino acid phenylalanine. Nirenberg and Matei had finally cracked the genetic code for at least one amino acid. 
Subsequently, Harigobind Khorana formulated a chemical method to produce well-defined nucleic acids. Long strands of RNA with every nucleotide in the exact position. This helped determine the rest of the genetic code which was expressed in the form of a chart. Today we know that the genetic code is an array of 64 codons. A sequence of three nucleotides on an RNA strand that encodes a specific amino acid during protein synthesis. Of the 64 codons, three codons, UAA, also called ochre, UAG, also called amber, and UGA, also called opal, act as a stop codon, which means they terminate the translation process and as such don't code any amino acid. Hence, they are known as nonsense codons or termination codons. The rest of the 61 codons code the 20 amino acids found in the human body. Moreover, one codon codes for only one specific amino acid, which makes the genetic code unambiguous and specific. For example, the codon UGG codes for tryptophan and AUG codes for methionine as well as acts as a start codon which means it initiates the protein synthesis. The genetic code is also a degenerate which means that many different codons encode a particular amino acid. Take the case of serine which is coded by six different codons including UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG, AGU, and AGC. Phenylalanine, on the other hand, is coded by codons UUU and UUC. Did you know that the genetic code is almost universal and the same throughout all living organisms? The codon GUG, for instance, codes for amino acid valine in plants as well as animals.